Act. This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I start another of my trilogies on the big subjects. This subject is nothing. Andre Hollow, a Zen uh, monk, is here to speak with uh, me about his opinions on the matter, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is nothingness. My guest is Andre Hollow, also known as Andre Taysan. He is a Zen uh, Buddhist monk, and he has written some books on the subject of nothingness. Andre, if you could give me a little bit of background about who you are and uh, your interest in the subject. Okay. So, Dan, I'd like to begin. Thank you for inviting me to be on your show. Um, I was not raised Buddhist. My mother uh, is a non-practicing Lutheran. My dad is from the Middle East. He's Muslim. Well, whenever I tell people that I'm Buddhist, they're, they're surprised because we got like the beginnings of a, of a bad bar joke. Buddhist, a Muslim, and a, uh -huh. and a Christian. So uh, my interest in Buddhism began very, um, very prominently in high school. I read Siddhartha, which is not original. I think a lot of people read that book, and it resonated with them. And um, I went to college at Rutgers, and I was an English major, and I didn't really pursue the path of introspection or contemplation at all until I graduated college and I started uh, teaching. And again, I encountered Siddhartha, the book I taught at this time from a teacher's point of view. But uh, I started to become interested in Buddhism primarily because the teachings spoke to me. Uh, the Buddha didn't pull, pull any punches when he says that life, uh, how we want to interpret it, life is suffering. That seemed consistent with my experience. So mm -hmm. I started um, sitting with a local Zen group. And then from there, I traveled to Philadelphia, about an hour away from Philly, and started sitting with another group. And eventually, I wanted to bring my practice to a more uh, definitive or, I guess, visible form. So I uh, found my teacher online, who was Wanji Dharma, otherwise known as his, his I guess, American name is Tim, uh, is... Uh, uh, Paul Lynch and so I met him online and uh, we we started talking and I meet with him regularly once a week online just like this and I ordained with him as a Zen monk and through him I've uh, continued my practice studying and especially in terms of um, you know the, the formal elements of Buddhist practice and then uh, kind of tangential to that was my interest in Nothingness. Um, I read I Am That by Nisargadatta Maharaj, and it just flew in the face of every experience or anything that I'd ever read before that, including Zen masters from you know China 1,200 years ago. Uh, he was just this unwaveringly powerful figure who demanded that we abandon everything in order to wake up to that which is the most absolute, I suppose we could call it, the truest. And for me, when I started to digest this into my own practice, the most appropriate term was nothingness. I guess we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, I, about a month and a half, two months ago, I did a show on uh, Buddhism, the origins, and I had a couple of experts talking about that. And uh, uh, here in America and the West in general, but especially America, there's always seems to be a divide between what people call Eastern and Western thought. Um, and nothing that seems to be one of those things that does have a different definition in the West, in the scientific tradition of what nothing is, versus the East which is more of a philosophical conception of what nothingness is. Do you buy that there is a difference in the Western and Eastern approaches to nothing? I think yes, in the sense that Eastern, um, and that's a broad term, but Eastern notions of nothingness are more experiential because they're grounded in this, this uh, practice of contemplation, meditation, yoga, whereas... Uh, I think that Western forms may be either more scientifically grounded or philosophically based. But even but if, if you read my work, it, my approach to nothingness departs from 
conventional Buddhist um, perspectives on what they would call shunyata, and that's commonly rendered in English as emptiness. So um, my approach is, is more uh, more influenced by, I would say, other thinkers like Nisargadatta than it would officially be under the auspices of Buddhism itself. Uh, and so if you could delineate in two or three points, if you can, uh, maybe what your difference is between, uh, sure. I guess, I know I know there are different types of Buddhism I spoke of in the other show, but uh, I guess if you wanted to use a term like mainstream Buddhism versus your own opinions on nothingness. Okay. When we talk about shunyata or emptiness, or in some cases we might call it void or nothingness, and it's a Sanskrit term, but... It's most easily understood, I think, as not only emptiness of having any particular characteristics or selfhood, but is easily, um, or I guess the best way to con convey it is interconnectedness of things. So there's nothing that, that separates a cup from, say, the spoon that's inside the cup. Uh, when we look for the spoonness inside the spoon, there is no spoonness. Uh, everything. Uh, degenerates or into a matrix of interconnections. And that's the, the traditional Buddhist approach, interdependence, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh, the, the Vietnamese Zen monk, calls it. My own, my own um, understanding of nothingness was propelled by my readings of Sargadatta. And what he constantly insists on is that whatever we can hear, see, smell, taste, touch, or feel is not ultimately ourselves. So when I feel an emotion, that's not ultimately mine because I'm witnessing that emotion. It, it occurs inside of my awareness and dissipates inside that awareness. Same thing with any sort of sensory experience. I hear something, there's the hear, but I'm not the sound technically because the sound disappears and yet this experience continues. I, I continue, the sound has disappeared. Thoughts as well. So he rigorously uh, uh, forces us to confront our notion of who we think we are. And so any one of these objects inside of our awareness are not ultimately us. Uh, we have this intuitive sense that there is an I, an adoring I, whether we want to call it consciousness, awareness. Ultimately, that too has to be discarded. So his approach was... Um, the title of my first book, which is Neti Neti, not this, not that. That's a Sanskrit term. Um, it's a practice as well. The Buddha, pra uh, the Buddha taught this indirectly when he says that none of the things that we encounter are self. Um, the tastes that I experience are not my, they're not me because they disappear. They're not mine because I cannot control them. Mm -hmm. But you 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 have used personal pronouns like I and me. So I mean, don't don't we just get to you know the old thing about turtles all the way down, a turtle on the back of a turtle? In that, if you are not the person tasting, let's say that cup of coffee, I assume that you just drank, uh, where where are you? If if you're nothingness, though, doesn't it become sort of like a Russian doll shell game? At some point, there has to be a thing that is speaking to me, Dan. You know. In, I mean, in a traditional Buddhist approach, they talk about it's, in, it's interconnectedness. So uh, the uh, the response is that there is no um, there is no substantial I that's experiencing that drink of water. Rather, it's a stream of conditions. So I can't exist without oxygen. So to say that I am drinking that water would be to divorce me from the, the interconnected matrix, which is everythingness. Uh, my experience though was to to push beyond all. Sensory experiences, uh, whether they're emotional, um, cognitive, and insistently s declare none of these things are I. Mm -hmm. Until until we arrive at the one thing that we can no longer negate, the one thing that we cannot say is not I, because the I has. Uh, disappeared entirely. It's like a um, before you enter a house, you got to take your shoes off. Well, imagine you're still, you got to take your shoes off, and then you've got to take off all of your sensory experiences, all all cognitive, all emotion. As we negate these things, eventually we arrive at the, do you think, that which is not. Do Do you think that one of the problems? Uh, 
is with language itself. Because as I look uh, on, and I'll link to your Amazon book page, uh, as I look at the top two titles there, the first one is No Mind, Realizing Your True Nature, and the second one is God is Nothingness, Awakening to Absolute Non-Being. Yet both of those titles uh, contain verbs, realizing and awakening, which suggests that there has to be a thing that is experiencing the action of the verbs. You know what I'm saying? So you get to sort of this circularity is that how can you be a non-being if you're awakening to non-being? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Ultimately, I mean, this is a question that's haunted Buddhist thought uh, and Vedantic thought, which is you know the Hindu branch of one of the Hindu, one of the Hindu branches of introspection. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, who's the one that's experiencing uh, these things? The language, as Zen is very aware of, is a, is a tricky, thorny thing. Uh, it can we can use it to liberate others and ourselves. But we can easily, just as easily, be bound by that very same language. So if I use terms like "ultimately" or "I," we're just using them co for conventional purposes. Um, in the same way as um, when I speak to my students, I'm a high school teacher. So if I speak to them and I say "I," well, is that the same "I" that that returns home later on and becomes "Daddy" to my children? Mm -hmm. So these are these are um, context specific, and so we don't want to grapple too much with the language or, or hold on too much to the language and said we could use it but use it gently right um nothing or nothingness is what would be termed though as a superlative just like you can't be more perfect you can't have less than nothing in, in a sense yeah. you know there's that famous movie less than zero and, and there are negative numbers but zero that that's actually something different uh, and you can't have good without bad uh i know a lot of i guess the stereotype of a western approach to to Eastern thought about these things uh, is would be like that uh, uh, people will say things like all is nothing, nothing is all. Is nothingness in a sense then everything as well? Because if if it is a superlative and there's total nothingness, then in a sense it would have to be everything since we do have these, whether it's an illusion or not, these experiences of the cosmos. So is there a, is nothingness just the flip side to everythingness? That's a great question. I think from uh, if you were speaking a traditional Buddhist sense, mm -hmm. the, the, the easy, the, the most direct reply would be yes. From my experience, I like to think of it this way: that everything we can cognize, everything we've ever experienced in our life, any object inside of consciousness, exists as well, what I'll call being, and that entire being, with a capital B, abides inside of this greater totality which is nothingness so the entire empirical or phenomenal world that we have it that we enjoy um this is the realm of science or any other discipline is encompassed inside of beingness and yet beingness itself is like a moat of dust inside of nothingness so this nothingness has no features whatsoever. So you know, um, it had you cannot cognize it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. If you could, then it would be inside of what I'll call beingness. Mm -hmm. And so there's some there is that which precedes or predicates beingness. So everything that we experience, the one we might call the entire universe, multiverse, however we want to conceive it, exists inside of or as a result from uh, of that nothingness mm -hmm. which has no features whatsoever has no it doesn't contain all features um so if uh, and the only way that that i know that the only way to communicate that is through negation so it is not these things mm -hmm. um i want to use a physics term that you may or not uh, be aware of and, and related to a, a buddhist concept that i've heard of and um there's the idea of what's called non-locality that uh, when scientists look try to find electrons in these large colliders that uh if you know if you think you know where the electron is it's not there you can't pin it down uh and there have been some wild ideas people saying that there's only one electron in the whole cosmos and it's it's everywhere uh and that remind makes me think of the idea that uh uh and it's not just buddhist thought but other uh religions or, or thoughts too have it that we are all part of everything and as i said if nothing is also everything uh does that does that uh mean that uh for example that uh you 
and I are just manifestations of a, a, a greater thing that isn't aware necessarily at the Dan or the Andre level that we are part of that greater thing, which is nothing? Uh, again, I'll, I'll start with the default answer, which seems to be the Buddhist approach. Yes, that everything is ultimately interconnected, so that there is no uh, there is no separation. We can have differentiation. An alligator is not a squirrel. A puppy's not a kitten. These things are clearly different, and yet, ultimately, when we, when we come to examine it, they're not separate from one another. So everything can be on either a, on an empirical level or maybe on a subatomic level. Everything can be connected or not separate non-dual, non-local. My experience has been that anything that we anything that we can experience is not ultimately final. So if, uh, to use an example, if my television's in the other room and I walk away from my television, I'm no longer experiencing that television. So that television cannot be, ult cannot be ultimately final for the sheer fact that it's no longer within, within my primary experience, and my primary experience, I mean what I hear, smell, taste, touch, feel, emote, uh, and cognize at this present moment. See, but this is rooted in the Zen Buddhist approach, which puts primacy to experience. So uh, anything that's occurring beyond my experience is purely conceptual, because I don't, my dog's outside right now. I don't know what he's up to, but anything that I think about is not directly within the sphere of my experience. What is... Is our conversation, the feel of the cushion beneath me, my hand, the drink of water, all of these things are immediate and and therefore uh, I verifiable. That which is beyond that is, is purely conceptual. Yeah. In, in terms of experience. I'm not saying they don't exist, but they're just uh, conceptual in regards to my my being here right now. So nothingness can be both uh, uh, a destination, but also a practice. So what is it that I'm not experiencing at this present moment? Because uh, I, I know that my consciousness is not final. It disappears when I go to sleep at night. There are interruptions inside my consciousness or my, or my awareness. So what is it that cannot be negated at all? Yeah. It seems to me that nothingness, at least if we're thinking about consciousness is absence. For example, a few years ago, I had a hernia operation, and I remember the doctors giving me some fluid, I'm laying on the bed, and they said, oh. you, you'll go out in 10 seconds or so, and I remember lying on that gurney or whatever, and I see the lights passing, and the next thing I know, my wife is touching my hand, and about 90 minutes to two hours had passed, and literally, it's like those 90, to two hour, 90 minutes to two hours are gone. But if I try to conceptualize nothing, I would think of blackness or silence, right. but blackness is not nothing. Silence no. is not nothing. But that chunk of my life that I have zero remembrance of, memory of, uh, when I had my hernia operation, that to me is closer to nothing. Just like, for example, if I asked you what was it like to be alike, uh, alive in 1920, you nor I could know that. Precisely, right? Yeah. And I use those as tools to, to um, disrupt our attachment to that which is not ultimately final and propel us into an experience of nothingness. In nothingness, though, the, the, the final, the, the last thing we have to throw out is uh, the I itself, our intuitive sense that there is an I experiencing. So when you were having your hernia operation, there's no I whatsoever. In the same way as there's no I in 1920, or there will be no I in 20, I don't know, 2000. 250. Mm -hmm. This I, this temporary sense of beingness, will disappear and there will only be nothingness. Mm -hmm. the, the, the catch, the loophole, is that there will be no I to cognize it. Yeah. And we can experience that same nothingness right here, right now. There are a certain of different little tricks we can we can use, tools, upaya, and some skillful means to push us into that experience. Like, uh, exactly like, where were you before your parents were born? Yeah. Yeah. Or what? What are the eyes in the back of my head seeing? Yeah. 
Well, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so I can't see. I can see through this. Yeah. But uh, uh, under normal circumstances, when I'm just sitting here, and if I say, what, what is it behind me? What am I experiencing that is physically behind me? There's nothing. I, I don't experience that yeah. at all. So that is um, a, a ticket or a, a useful little tool that we can use to experience that which is always present, that nothingness. Yeah. Uh, let me talk about uh, a couple of your books and I'll give you a chance at first just give a little synopsis of uh, them, but also then explore deeper. I mentioned one of your books uh, is named God is Nothing that's Awakened to Absolute Non-Being. Uh, the God of that title, is that, that would not be uh, the Hebraic, Judaic God. Uh, what do you mean by God? And then how is that God, if we call it God or a deity, how could that be nothing? Uh, no, it's not. It is not a a creator or any sort of intelligent entity. Rather, it, I think it's more influenced by what we would call the Tao. Taoism in Neo Confucianism, they start to differentiate between is the Tao everythingness or is the Tao the source of the everythingness. And I, from based on my experiences, I opt for the latter which is that there is beingness, the entirety of everything, but then there is that substratum upon which everything occurs. Uh -huh. Consciousness feels like a light of awareness, but the majority of my beingness, and I use that term beingness lowercase and loosely, is, is actually non-beingness because there's a dot of light of awareness, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, feeling, and it's occurring inside of this vast field of not awareness. So I'll call that not awareness with a capital N, upon the capital T. So when I say God is nothingness, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is to get us to realize that as much as the Big Bang is a historical event that could have happened, billions of years ago, the source, and I'm talking ontologically here, of our experience and of beingness itself is present right here, right now. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, as when scientists try to precede the Big Bang, they're like, well, what occurred before that? There was nothingness and then there's somethingness. I'm suggesting that nothingness is always present um, as the, the lack of a ground or the insubstantial ground of our experience right here right now so that's the god that i'm referring to um which is which is pointing towards both an empirical um in terms of consciousness but but also it's the, the basis of beingness itself and beingness encompasses the physical world the emotional world the, the psychological world all of these things occur as little dots inside uh, inside of and as the result of non-being, nothingness, non-awareness, and I, and I well, kind of borrowed that title, God is nothingness, yeah. maybe as a bit of a publicity, yeah. it's got a kind of nice ring to it. Well, but, let um, me just ask, challenge though, our notion of what God is. Let me just ask, though, because um, another trilogy that I'm in the midst of doing is on free will, and it would seem to me that your idea of uh, this God or this uh, existential nothingness or whatever you might want to call it is actually, in a sense, quite liberating because it seems to me that it then directly empowers you or me or anyone else uh, that there is no fallback that we can blame the devil or we can blame circumstance that, that uh, for good or ill, we do have free will in your mind. Am, am I misreading that? This would seem to suggest to me that you are a, that your belief system would be a proponent of that free will exists. That Andre has the absolute free will because you are this thing that has arisen out of nothingness. There is no substrate below you that that is controlling, pulling your strings. I would say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that because it's not harkening back to any sort of original, um, whether called fate, destiny, uh, God as an entity that it's liberating in that regard because we're not bound to to, no, to to being good or to being bad or having someone ultimately deciding our fate. So in that regard, we have free will. But in another sense, when we're, when we're free of the notion of I entirely, then, uh, then who's the one who's making the decision? It seems like, empirically, the decision occurs on its own. I mean, it, just based on my experience, I don't know where my thoughts come from. 
sometimes mm. they just pop up is that the unconscious i don't know but a thought will arise i'd like to believe i'm exercising executive control as to whether or not to act on the impulse or to maybe continue with the thought but things seem to have a life of their own and they continue uh void of this intrinsic i so no, I but i mean but I mean, you would I would have what we would call an ethical filter. If if you're walking in a park with your wife and your kids and you see another family there and, and if some bizarre thought came, I'm going to push that little girl off the bridge and watch her drown in the river, yeah. ultimately you would say, well, I'm not going to yeah. do that. So I, there has to be some kind of filter that is empowering you. Uh, in Absolutely, some yeah. I'm not dismissing it or, or undervaluing yeah. the everyday experience of, of ethics and morality. In fact, I think it, this underlines it, uh -huh. because when we put things in their, uh, in their, in their place, uh, and I don't think it needs to diminish the world that we live in or being this. It just, it just recognizes what it is. It's almost like if you have a parent and a child, there's nothing wrong with being a child. It's just understanding that the child is dependent on the parent. So in the analogy, the parent is nothingness, mm -hmm. and then the, the child is the beingness, the world that we live in. Um, it's just, it depends on, the child depends on the parent as, as being this depends on nothingness. Yeah, your subtitle for that book, and I'll get up to the other one in a moment, but is Awakening to Absolute Non-Being. Uh, the interesting thing I find just about that subtitle is that uh, to awaken to non-being would suggest that if one is asleep, that uh, most people then are the term, I don't know if you're aware of, philosophical zombies, that people just shuffle around in life making decisions or seeming to make decisions, but in a sense, they are sleepers. They, they are just uh, somnambulists or, or, or zombies that are just walking around. And that, uh, so yeah, am I misreading that uh, viewpoint? That well, uh, that title is in response, I think, to my practice within the formal sphere of wisdom, because we'll talk about say enlightenment, which is ultimately the goal in most schools of Buddhist of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, are you attaining enlightenment? Are you realizing enlightenment? It has a connotation that attainment seems to think that uh, I wasn't enlightenment and then I become enlightened mm -hmm. or that I'm somehow cultivating and becoming something that I'm not already. So then we sometimes offer the term realizing. Realizing implies that I already am. And they say, well, I'm, wearing, I'm already wearing my glasses. I just have to realize, like, oh, there they are. And then awakening is just my own personal term that I like because we're, we're just realizing that um, something is already there, which is present. So it's not to necessarily imply that, that the majority of people are, are lost or per se. It's just in response, I think, to my Buddhist training, yeah. which is uh, to suggest that we are in possession of everything that we are that we may be looking for, because yeah. we are expressions of that nothingness. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer, so forgive me if I uh, harp on some uh, word stuff, but uh, the term I've always found interesting is the one you just used, enlightened. Most people, when they think of that, they talk about walking into the light, that light breaks the dark, but the other flip side of that, enlightened can also mean to take the burdens off, to lift some burdens off your back, to make lighter. Uh, and I, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, since uh, we're talking about nothingness, nothingness would presumably be burdenlessness in some kind of way, uh, if, if that's also uh, a paradigm, if you will, to, to strive for, that nothingness or a state of nothingness is to get free of all the angst and the whatever that we carry around intellectually or psychologically. Yeah, Alan Watt says the, the most liberating thing is to become nobody, to, to realize that we are ultimately, that there is no intrinsic I or self. Uh, I love I love the analogy you talked about. Enlightenment meaning light versus enlightenment means to shed off. I like to think of emptiness, the Buddhist term, as a verb. Mm -hmm. So rather than thinking of it as a state or or an ontological descriptor, it's rather it's a it's an injunction. It's something we do. We empty ourselves. The way I approach that is through the process of neti neti, which is. I am not these things. These things are not me. So uh, I like to think of it as, in terms of, of, of practice, things that we can do. But 
the, the opposite of the Enlightenment is, uh, I guess, in darkening, mm-hmm. which harkens back to the, the feeling that we intuitively have or about nothingness, right? We, we tend to think of nothingness as an absence of light and there's some sort of dark quality to it. And in Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism in particular, they talk about returning to the darkness because in darkness there's non-differentiation. Light distinguishes the world things separate from one another. Whereas darkness is the experience of where non different where everything is connected. So I would take that a step further and say I like the the metaphorical richness of darkness perhaps more than, than enlightenment because it's that darkness that is so similar to our intu- intuitions of what nothingness is. Uh, Nothing yeah. has no ground upon which for us to hold on to. Um, your other book that uh, is relevant here is No Mind Realizing Your True Nature. Um, that brings to mind, uh, again, this is a Western uh, stereotype, I guess, that uh, you know people, uh, you, you think of people walking around in robes and just meditating, thinking they want to be like a rock or like a plant or something. Um, as far as we know, inanimate matter has zero consciousness, uh, at least scientifically here in the West. Uh, plants have maybe rudiments of it, uh, insects, amoebas, uh, very tiny things have a little bit more than we can work ourselves up to frogs and dogs and cats and whales and gorillas and humans. Um, is the state of no mind or the state of nothingness most aptly embodied, if you will, by inanimate? Objects in animata versus animata. I think it's a it's a useful paradigm, a way to approach our understanding of um, no mind. Traditionally, no mind, uh, which means is wu xin, rendered in Chinese, that refers to our experience of just ability to kind of flow seamlessly with life without the burden of an, like an executive mind, which is worrisome. And, and, and tends to slow us down. And so I've appropriated that term when I say no mind to refer to that which uh, is our avail- is the availability of nothingness at this present moment. So I might, I might use, okay, what is that rock experiencing right now? And I'll use that as a um, jumping off point in order to catalyze my experience of nothingness right now. Um, and these are all just tools for us to to return to that, to reawaken, I suppose, to that nothingness. And it's, it's ever present. It's non evasive. It's evasive. It's not, um, there's no special trick to experiencing it. It's always there. Um, it'd be like, what is, I might say, what is my, what is my tail experiencing at this moment? Mm. Well, I don't have a tail. So it, it, it's just another way of kind of, um, negating, what my assumptions are about this uh, nothingness in order to induce an experience of it. Do you, think, th- do you think that either uh, uh, Buddhism or some other thoughts that value nothingness sometimes maybe overvalue it? Because uh, as I look behind you, and you'd mentioned eyes behind your head, I can see what appears to be wood paneling. And I, if you had to ask me... Uh, what is a more interesting thing in the cosmos? I would say that Andre is a bit more interesting than the wood paneling. Yes, the wood paneling may be nice if you wax it or something or, or, or shine it up, but, but if uh, if your basement, I assume you're in your basement or something, uh, yeah. were to catch on fire, Andre knows to get the hell out of there, uh, uh, whereas yeah. the wood paneling is going to burn. Um, right. So do you think that, that somethingness is, that somethingness and nothingness are of equal value, that you know, great question. Um, so, when I talk about that which is behind me right now, I'm talking about just simply empirically, yeah. because I, I have no awareness of what is actually behind me. So, I'm just using that as a tool to to go back to that experience of nothingness. Now, of course, if I turn around. Now this, now this uh, the handling is in front of me and is part of my awareness. All of this is beingness, as, as I'll call it, abiding on top of like a cork in the ocean of 
nothingness. The catch, of course, is that without beingness, like you like you point out, there is no there's no experience of nothingness. And so beingness is magnificent. It's an expression of nothingness. Mm -hmm. So it's the manifest in the same way as we might say the roots. You have the roots of the plant are underground, um, and the plant expresses itself through its beingness, which is the stalk of the plant and its fruit and its leaves. And, and it's, so uh, it's not to undervalue or diminish the value of beingness. In fact, I think it frees us to experience things more fully because we realize that it, it, it's true nature kind of to go back to that metaphor where it, this is the child. The child is beautiful. Beingness is just simply uh, we 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 tend to fixate too much on beingness and think that it's ultimately final, mm. and so we import more value on something than or more more importance to be redundant uh, onto it than uh, than it might necessarily deserve. Primarily because we we misunderstand it, we're not seeing it for that which it truly is, which is is an expression of that nothingness. So, in, in a very real sense, I mean, these are two sides to the same understanding, which is beingness is a, is the manifestation of not beingness, and beingness frees us to experience not being. Because when there's when there when there's no beingness, when that then I suppose when I die, it will no longer be an Andre. And there'll be no more experience. There'll be no more manifestation of Andre at this moment. Yeah. Uh, the point you made that, that I thought was good was that nothing cannot know itself. Something can know itself and at least conceptualize nothing if not fully understand it. And I'm wondering then if the power of nothingness, uh, at least as human beings are able to conceptualize it, is that it at least provides the contrast that uh, if we had no even conception of nothingness, our, our experience of something would be infinitely poorer. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Yes, and um, but one of the barriers to nothingness itself is the is like you put out, like you said, is the the concept of nothingness. So when we have a concept of nothingness, now we're creating what we might call a positive nothingness. When we say darkness, well, darkness is a quality part of my experience in the experiential world and so now I'm imputing characteristics onto nothingness it's no longer nothingness at that point it's a positive it's almost like a something nothingness mm -hmm. and so uh, certainly experiencing nothingness I think value recenters reorients and revalues the world that we that we live in so long as we don't try to paint any features onto that nothingness it's like it's like if you were to bring a paintbrush outside and try to paint this paint the air with that paintbrush that's the same thing as trying to um attach attributes to nothingness it, it has it's completely unattributeless in in hindu terms uh they call it uh, nirguna brahma which means god which is beyond any attributes whatsoever and i think that that's a a useful way of understanding it. You said positive nothingness. Oh, is negative nothingness the way that uh, this materialistic sort of capitalistic society would view nothingness? Uh, you know, just colloquially, people will say, uh, you know, I want to be somebody. I don't want to be a nobody. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. be nothing. Is that what you would term uh, as a negative nothingness? I think so, yes. And, and, and it often... Critics of nothingness, Buddhist included, would often accuse my point of view as being nihilistic. And I think that that's just because they're looking at it from maybe a, a, a material, materialist point of view, perhaps, as if to say that if there is a nothingness and if nothing is um, an origination point, perhaps, to our experience or to the phenomenal world, then that somehow devalues the world. And I think that's a false assumption. Uh, I think that nothingness provides ultimate value to my experience because I'm just, it's just a simply understanding of how the basis of who and what I am. The majority of the time, the majority of my experience is as nothingness. And my experience abides in like a little quirk inside of on top of that awareness and eventually will recede and so that i find extremely reassuring and 
um, and helpful in my everyday living. So for me, it's not nihilistic or uh, negative in any sense. That's it's only negative if we assume that the that positive things or attributes are somehow good per se. Um, there's nothing to say. That's that's rooted inside of a, maybe a cultural point of view. I don't know. Well, we spent most of this interview talking about nothingness in uh, very sort of existential terms. I want to put uh, and ask you a bit more about your own personal, I guess, your own personal view of cosmology, your own uh, sense of the cosmos or the multiverse, omniverse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, and uh, a, a common uh, thing that is proposed these days uh, with this technological age that we live in is uh, that we may be living in a computer simulation. I personally don't buy it, but um, the idea being that uh, God, if you will, or the creator is basically a giant computer programmer and that uh, if just like with the turtles going down with the earth on the back, that uh, we could be in a simulation that's a simulation that's a simulation, blah, blah, blah. But I would always argue, and my argument would be that even if it's simulations all the way down, at some point at infinity minus one, there has yeah. to be some reality that has started the very first computer simulation. And in a similar way, we could talk about, uh, I guess, the the gods and the branching universes, the dream within the dream within the dream within the dream kind of thing. What is your own personal view of the cosmos? And like I said, this isn't directly about nothingness, but I think it can uh, provide a listener a frame work from where your ideas are coming from. I would have to resort to the default kind of Buddhist per perspective on this, and that's understanding that things are um, are interconnected. And that everything is an, is an expression of the totality. So, when I, in a sense, when I chew a piece of gum, it's the, not only is it that I'm like chewing on the entire universe, so to speak, but the entire universe is chewing on a piece of gum as well. So, it, it, it goes both ways uh, in that respect. Uh, that nothing can abide on its own, nothing can exist independent of anything else. And that any sort of designation that we have, um, for instance, this card right here, for me to to cut it out of the rest, the fabric of the rest of reality is simply arbitrarily arbitrary, and uh, it's our inability to realize that we're, when we're making these arbitrary distinctions, it's our inability that leads us to suffering. So, um, my approach has always been empirically grounded. Like, what is okay? What's the usefulness of this? If we are inside of a inside of a computer program what can we do to make this the best computer program possible how can we how can we live the most ethical fruitful compassionate lives and the way to do that is to, to cultivate some sort of practice that's that's helpful to us and to others uh it's interesting you mentioned another thing that's i guess a western stereotype uh in a belief of what buddhism or zen thought is uh and that is that nothingness is somehow related to non-suffering um uh is that perhaps uh, a utilitarian function of your conception of nothing that nothingness helps to ease whatever we might call the travails of being if I realize that, and I'll try to be as pragmatic as possible, if I have a pain in my knee, and I realize that that pain is not ultimate, because it, because it comes and it goes, and more pertinently, it's not ultimately me. It is not who I am, because it comes and it goes, then I'm less likely to allow it to dominate my experience with with all that, that painful narrative which often occurs, which is, I'm the victim, uh, why is this happening to me? That's the real suffering element. It's not just the physical pain, it's the, the emotional trauma that we put ourselves through. So when I realize that these things are not ultimately me, then I'm less likely to hold on to them, and more likely to allow them to come and go. So we can look at nothingness or emptiness as as I alluded to before, injunctions to just their directives. They allow us, rather than necessarily arriving at a state of experience or state of beingness, it allows us just to empty, to, to live uh, in this present moment without holding on to the present moment. Just let things go as they, as they arrive. Let them come and let them go. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, but that would naturally, uh, from what you're saying, I'm, I just got the image of uh, the famous uh, physicist Stephen Hawking, uh, who has ALS, and you know, for the last 30 years he hasn't been able to speak. He can only direct his chair with, I think, now uh, the blinks of his eyes or something. Um, someone like him, who has a permanent degenerative condition. Um, how would that person escape into nothingness? I mean, again, I, we, I'm just speculating here because you can't be Stephen Hawking, but h how would someone with that kind of, or, or even someone with permanent pain, uh, an ex-football player who has con concussions and whatnot, how, how, do they, how would they be able to do it? Because they could not say, like you did, that the knee pain is not essentially part of them because uh, the ALS is essentially part of Stephen Hawking. It's, it's part of him. It reminds me of Shawnee Get Your Gun. That it was, it was a novel, anti-war novel, and it was a film about a young man who, on the last day of World War One, gets, I believe, mortared mm -hmm. and is trapped in his body because they have to amputate his arms and his legs, mm -hmm. and he's blind and deaf. I think he can't taste anything as well. So he's trapped inside of his body. Doesn't know when he's dreaming and when he isn't. So in a, in, in as a metaphor, he has negated all of his sensory experiences. He's not, he doesn't, I don't, as far as I remember, he doesn't have any physical pain, but he doesn't experience anything. He has no sense of uh, tactile sense, no sense of smell, sight, hearing. But there's still the, the cognizing mind. And so he's thinking, uh, he thinks part of the time, and other times he falls asleep, and he doesn't know when he's dreaming when he's sleeping. So and what I would say is to take that one step further and we have to negate that cognizing, what we assume is that cognizing subject, that I, that needs to, to um, be negated. And when we do that, then we might be in a more useful place or position to, to look at the pain of my knee mm -hmm. as not final. It hurts like hell. I'm not diminishing that at all. But it's not who I am. Any way, any way that I identify with it as as me and my totality is like mistaking the, uh, the tail of the elephant for the entire elephant. Who and what we are larger than any experience that we have, any individual experience. Hmm. Uh, it's in it's interesting because uh, when you mentioned uh, that book, I thought of uh, William Golden, who did *Lord of the Flies*. He also did a book called *Pincher Martin*. I don't know if you ever read that. It's about a guy. Yeah. It's about a guy who's. Uh, traveling in the North Sea or between Greenland and Iceland or something, he falls overboard and ends up on this island. It turns out that he actually dies right at the first page of the book, and all of the rest of the book is his experience after life until he dies. I, I believe he dies within the dream. It's been years since I read that. Uh, and so he's totally negating his own death as, for as long as he can, and uh, that, that just came to mind. But um, uh, if you ever want to read an interesting book, it's called Pincher Martin by William Golding. But uh, um, let me uh, uh, sort of uh, get wrapping up uh, here and, and sort of uh, bring some of these ideas together. And that is, uh, before I, uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about any other books you have coming up and whatnot, but let me just ask you, uh, in current science uh, thought, uh, you know, you had mentioned the Big Bang and uh, people will say, well, how could the whole cosmos come from nothingness? Um, and scientists have now replied, well, nothing isn't nothing in a physical sense, that there is potentiality, uh, there, there's uh, the potential right. stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, does that mean then, uh, if we accept the Big Bang happened and if we accept uh, a blend, say, of Western and Eastern ideas about nothingness, can nothingness evolve or is that antithetical to the idea of nothing? I would, I would first start by saying that it isn't so much from my experience that um, things have come from nothingness in a, in a historical sense, as if there was nothing and now there's something, but rather things are nothingness, ultimately. That when we, when we go back to our experience, if we, if we root it inside of an empirical practice, that I can identify that everything that occurs, occurs within that backdrop uh, against the backdrop of nothingness uh so to use an analogy would be like the, the screen upon which a, a film in a, in a movie theater is projected so the film 
and beingness, it's the, the world of experience that we live in, um, the nothingness, though, forms the backdrop. So when if we look at it in terms of historically, historically, it appears as though things may have emerged from nothingness. But based on my experience, things are ultimately themselves still nothingness. Now they're manifestations or expressions of it. Now the beingness can evolve. Uh, but as far as nothingness being attributeless, it, it has nothing to evolve into itself. Uh, I think that, that that's the realm of beingness. Beingness, existence, evolves. Um, and if, if we want to think of it, use, maybe a useful way of understanding it is that nothingness could be understood perhaps as uh, potentiality. It's that fruitful ground uh, that the womb of from which all of experience and beingness emerges. And I borrow that from Taoism, mm. viewing um, existence itself as a manifestation of, or, or, or I guess, a, the child of the great womb, which is the Tao, the, 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 the female principle, creative principle. Well, I mentioned uh, that I will link to uh, your books on your uh page on Amazon. Also, original, what is it? Uh, I'm sorry, originalmindzen.com is a website of yours that I will link to as well. Let me just ask you, uh, what, if any, uh, books or uh, what, what is currently next in line for you uh, project-wise? Is there anything being written that, or are you going to, uh, what, what, what is next on your plate? Um, the title, so I uh, Sometimes I have a very hard time coming up with titles. This one just slipped out at me. And so it would be called Beyond Not Dwelling. Many of West, Western, or sorry, I should say Eastern influence Western uh, spiritual practices talk about non duality, talk about the interconnectedness or the oneness of reality. And while I think that's extremely valuable and true, I don't think it's ultimately final. And so uh, I would like to open a dialogue and a practice that's pushing us beyond just being this, as interconnected as it may be, to something that precedes entirely the, uh, the realm of experiences. And so that, that, that's what I would call nothingness, non-being, non-awareness, no mind. All these are synonyms for, this, for the same thing. So no, beyond non duality would be the the, t the working title right now with a subtitle. I'm fond of subtitles for some reason. <laughs> well, uh, in that vein, let me ask a final question, and then you can just. Uh uh, wrap up any thoughts you may not have had yet expressed uh, uh, on the subject. Uh, and my final question to you then is: Your nothingness the same as my nothingness? The same as the nothingness of someone who's watching this video of you expound on nothingness? And then any final thoughts you have? So the the, the Zen teacher in me wants to just shout because that's how the Zen master evades that question, <laughs> or rather answers the question, or like slap. Um, but to give more practical response, if nothing has nothingness has no features or no qualities, then it cannot know differentiation at all. And so, uh, the assumption that that there is a, even an I in the first place that's somehow different from that nothingness is the final step that needs to be negated. So I have to, in order to really digest this experience and this realization, I have to realize that this I is not ultimate, that it comes and it goes, it, it's fluid, it changes. Sometimes I'm Andre the American, sometimes I'm Andre the Buddhist, sometimes I'm Andre dad, and so forth. So these are, that identity itself is, a, is a, an amorphous thing that we need to eventually look past entirely. So when you ask, you know, is my nothingness separate than your nothingness? I would, I would encourage us to examine who this I is that we think is experiencing the same or different in the first place. Okay, well, we'll end it on that. I want to thank you, Andre Halov, Andre Tayson, for your ideas. And anyone who wants to find out more can look below this video. I will link to both uh, your Amazon Books page as well as uh, your, uh, your philosophical page, I guess you would call it. And uh, thank you for your time and spending an hour speaking with me. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.